New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Yo, it's Ebro in the Morning, Laura Styles, Rosenberg. Uh, give it up for my friend, Mitchell Jackson, author. You know what I'm saying? Uh, professor. Wait, what other titles do you have? Uh, you're on faculty at Columbia now? No, no. Sh- University of Chicago. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. University. Excuse me. Yeah. These are my friends. These are like people I, I grew up with. This is Mitchell S. Jackson. Uh, this is your second book. This is the second one, yeah. Survival Math, Notes on an All-American Family. <clears throat> um, what is this about? Um, wow, you got a review from Oprah Magazine? Yeah, yeah. It's official, son. It's official. Yo, you're really an author. Man. So when we playing dominoes and drinking, yeah. you really got a job. I do have a job. You think he didn't? No, we actually, all of us, as a collective unit, never really <laughs> thought Mitch <laughs> he was doing anything. Okay, got it. For the many years he lived in his apartment, he said he was, I'm working on my book. It was this like six true. years. We'd be behind his back like, yo, this book is never coming it's, yeah, out. Yeah, that's regular, though. That's, that's regular that's author true. life. It was like 10 years working on 10. that joint. Yeah, yeah, on the first The one. first book, which was called what? The Residue Years. Residue years, yeah. which I, was a bestseller somewhere. It was, it did well, man. It did well. You know, it won some awards, it sold some books. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of it. It took a long time, but you know, it was worth it. And that was about <clears throat> you and how you came up, right? Yeah, in it was Portland, Oregon, and doing prison time. And... Yeah, I mean, mainly about how I got to prison, and also, you know, about my childhood, my mother's addiction, struggling with that. Um, about the neighborhood, you know, we grew up in the same era, you know, gang banging. Lots mm-hmm. of sports. Um, so, yeah. So, it really, it was like the precursor to survival, man. Smart black men who also ended up in jail and were on crimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking today how um, some people have described me as a drug dealer, but I never thought of myself as that was my identity. I it described was like, you that way, and I'm, I'm your, one of your best friends. Yeah. So but my I, friend Mitch. He's a drug dealer. I was a— You still say that? No. No. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah, it was like, you know, if you accept that as your identity, then that's who you are. But I, I did sell drugs, but I just never thought like, oh, yeah, I'm the dope dealer. And I think once you accept that, then it takes you into other areas. It manifests and I itself. Yeah, exactly. So this book, Survival Math, take us through it. What's this about? Um, <clears throat> and why is it so rough around the edges? What is this? It's rough because I thought it, fe- it, 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 it matched the content. Um, it matched the, the covers, like an unfinished uh, What's it called artwork. when you do the paper like that? Uh, some people call it Deco Edge. I forgot what the exact name of this is. I'm not but... that sophisticated. I, I thought they sent out an unfinished <laughs> book. He walked in the room. I said, Mitch, why did he, why you let him do your book yeah. like this? Man, I, I literally had to, to to ask and then really insinuate that I that I get that. Yeah, like special. you wanted this. Yeah, that's special. That's special. So they don't do this. This is extra money. That's extra money. Wow. I don't know why that would be extra money, right? It seems like they would just... Well, because the regular printing always does the same thing, and this is obviously not the regular print, so yeah. anytime you do anything different... Yeah. All right, so let's go back to the book. What is this one for? No, we just on? care about the pages, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought they didn't finish my friend Mitchell's book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, Survival Math came out of an incident I had when I was, like, early 20s, and uh, this is when I was selling drugs, and a guy... Um, that I had some beef with before, pulled a, a strap on me really early in the morning. It was like no witnesses out. You're an author now. You say gun. Gun. Yes, yes that's you right. Say a gun. A, a gun. And, firearm. Uh, a firearm. That's right. Well, the that's firearm. Right. Brandished his weapon. Yes, yes. The NRA. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he pulled it out, and uh, he was like, yo, you looking for me? And then so once he asked me that question, you know, I looked down the street. I'm like, there's no witnesses. I'm, I got a pistol, but I got it in my car, and I can't get to it. So I'm having all these kind of thoughts. And then what I said to him was, no, I'm not looking for you. And he put his pistol back in and rolled off. And I thought all of the decision making and calculations that I was making between are you looking for me and my response was survival math. So survival math is essentially like the calculations you have mm. to make when you're faced with a, a mortal threat. Oh, so you was like Neo in the Matrix. Uh, no, nah, I didn't dodge any bullets, but. I mean, kinda. Uh, well, hold on. So did, were you actually looking for him? I, he had tried to, uh, him and some guys had tried a home invasion. So I wasn't necessarily looking for him because to look for him meant I wanted to kill him. But also, yeah, it was a problem. You know, if somebody tried to kick in your door, then, you know, y'all got issues. And the neighborhood was so small that we were bound to see each other. I just didn't know we would see each other with me unarmed and him armed at That's five it. in the morning. And he ended up So you was somebody. looking for him, just not right then. <laughs> right, 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 right. 
Wait, not so, right yeah. now. I'm not looking for you right it's now. You guys never had issues <laughs> before. You had issues until no, you tried did. to break into your home. Yeah, that was that was the heart of our issue. But okay. he was like a, a grimy dude. I mean, he ended up murdering a couple people. Jesus. Oh, not just a few months later. So he he was really about it. <laughs> I so wasn't you, right. you really you looking, looking for me? For I'm not ready. You, yeah, in not, retrospect, you really weren't looking for me. I mean, I I thought, you know, he'll pull this trigger. That wasn't that that was that you definitely knew it was possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you go through. Um, I'm read through some of the chapters in the yeah. book. Uh, survival math. You can get it from my my brother and a friend Mitchell Jackson. Um, let's see here. Um, there was a book or a chapter in here. It, it, you break it up in parts. There's yeah. Parts and chapters. Mm-hmm. So Exodus. Yeah. Um, composite pops matrimony survivor files. Yeah. And so you break this book up into parts like, who are we? Mm-hmm. What have we learned? What have we endured? And how do we proceed? Yep. And is that how you see your life? Yeah. So um, the the sections of the book are actually, um, they begin with what are called sento poems. And sento poems are poems composed from the work of other poets. But in this case, I took historic American documents. So I took like Declaration of Independence, um, Gettysburg Address, um, Star Spangled Banner, and I took language from there and made poems to kind of contextualize these stories about, or these essays about my my family. So each one of them began with that as a kind of uh, context. Yo, my friend's smart, happening. man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yo, I have a smart friend. Yo, yeah. man, you make me look good, man. man Appreciate good. you, man. Um, notes on the All American Family. So <laughs> now, do you contextualize this through the lens of just being? A regular American citizen, and do you layer in race and that experience, Absolutely. economic experience as well? Absolutely. There's um, an essay in there called "American Blood," where I talk about the history of patriotism uh, in America and what is our relationship, the pe- people of color, what's our relationship to that. There's um, an essay called um, "Matrimony," where I talk about addiction and my mother, my mother's addiction, and kind of analogize it to uh, a long-term marriage. Mm. Um, yeah, so I take like a, a family uh, story, um, and then I try to expand on that and really try to like. <clears throat> there's a there's an essay called Apples, right? So my my father uh, was a pimp, <clears throat> but he would always cheat with women that were white, and I always wondered about that, and so that made me start thinking about white women, which made me start thinking about whiteness, which made me start thinking about the history of whiteness. So there's an essay in there, which I kind of trace the history of whiteness back to, I mean, basically Greece, ancient Greece. Um, so yeah, it would start with something really personal and then it would just dilate out and dilate you know, out. The, the like, idea of, of black, of the idea of blackness yeah. is <clears throat> defined by whiteness. whiteness. Yeah. Because Africans didn't think of themselves as black. Exactly. They were tribal people. Yeah. So and, and and now we fight for this idea of blackness. Yeah. But it's still defined by yeah, whiteness. Whiteness, which is the thing you're fighting against. Yeah. And then when you think of even African nations, <clears throat> every African nation's border was determined by a European. Yeah. Right. Whiteness. So yeah. even the presence of Africa, the name itself was defined by a white person. Yeah. That's both. That's so in my it, TED talk, man. I, I I talk about getting rid of to get rid of whiteness, which I think most people would argue like we should we shouldn't have whiteness, but you would also have to redefine what blackness means. Well, and then also Rosenberg, you talk about that, like whiteness. What is what? Well, that's not a thing. To be white isn't anything. But yeah, if you get rid of whiteness, how do you keep blackness? Right. The, exactly. You'd really be saying, hey, are we all down to opt out of everything? Right. right yeah. And the problem <laughs> is, you know, who wouldn't be down with that? Yeah. White people. <laughs> right. Right. Because that's would, their they, power structure. They would want yeah. out yeah. of blackness. I mean, you see that happening now. They're reasserting whiteness. All right. It's so crazy. Yeah. I guess I can't really identify with it, though, because I don't know anyone who... I don't think I personally know anyone who um, is consciously aware of their utilizing whiteness or yeah. any sort of... Yeah. You know, being a suburban Jew from the Northeast, right. it's a different sort of experience. Well, I really you don't. become aware of it when you feel like it's your safety or your zone or yeah. your suburbanness or whatever you've uh, defined yourself by uh, gets under attack. 
Yeah. Right. Maybe, yeah, maybe those things. You happen. know what I mean? And and it's like they're trying to, you know, they don't like our lifestyle or they don't, you know. I'm the opposite. My I usually feel my whiteness when I'm like doing something uh -huh. and I look around the room and I'm like, man. I'm the only this, one. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just like, this is white. When oh, I'm doing oh, like this. you see another white space. Like, I know I'm in it. And yeah. I'm looking around, I'm like, my God, this is truly white. This is yeah. embarrassing. Like, this would be bad for my brand. I don't even yeah. want people to see this happening. <laughs> like, we're at a Dave Matthews concert, and I don't see one black person here except the guy playing the violin. <laughs> I'm like, this is a problem. We got to do something about this. Now, is that what prompted you to write the book? Um, uh, what's happening in society right now? The I think shift, what, I guess, or the recalibration? I think me interested really in home uh, prompted me to write it. And when I say home, I really mean the stories of people where I'm from, I think, you know, if you think about blackness in the Northwest, like that's, those things don't, or they're not synonymous, right? Mm. So I really felt like if I didn't uh, set this down, then th that history might be lost. And so I was really, really trying to kind of uphold uh, the people that I grew up with. Uh, and then once I got into it, because I've been working in academia so long, I knew that whatever I was talking about had a longer reach that I, I couldn't just look at what was happening in the 80s. Like, I had to go further back if I really wanted to examine it. Yo, it was a trip. When I moved to Portland in 1999, I had never, and coming from Northern California, um, I had never seen that type of, like, segregation. Yeah. In a But in a Portland's, like, liberal, hippie, yeah. tree hugger. Was it hugger. always like that? Well, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I came to find out, but all the black people lived, I mean, 95%, by yeah. the way, the city's only 2 3% black, the yeah. whole city. Yeah. But 95% of the black folks lived in Northeast Portland in one neighborhood. Yeah. Wow. And then when, I, I just recently saw, I don't know if y'all watch Finding Your Roots on PBS, mm. but Jean Pap Baptiste, who's this, you know, jazz player from New Orleans, learned that his mother... Um, had or his grandmother maybe had went to Portland, Oregon, ah, because she that. they had during the World War, the Second World War, yeah. they started hiring black folks, and there was no like you know black people could just get jobs. Yeah, and one of the shipyard jobs. Yeah, that's was Exodus in, in there. I talk about that. That's how the they came there for that to work in Kaiser's right. shipyards, uh, and then there was a flood, a Vanport flood. I think it was nineteen forty eight. In Vancouver. And no, it was like Delta Park right there. So Delta Park was actually where there was. And it's like a marsh, it's marshland. So, of course, they build the place for the African-Americans on marshland. So, right. when so they floods, came to Portland, Oregon for work in the shipyards. The, on, the only place they could live was in a marshland, which was a <laughs> floodplain. Yeah. Of course, right. Yeah. Then it floods and they moved to Northeast. Oh, so that's how people got to Northeast That's how they Portland. got there. Yep. Interesting. Well, it's all in this book, Survival Math, Notes on the All-American Family. My friend uh, Mitchell Jackson, who when he texts us, it says MS Jackson. And we've been calling him Miss Jackson since Outcast put the, <laughs> put the song out. That's true. You're so foul, I cannot. Yo, give it up one Thanks, time. Mitch. Mitchell, right, man, get right. the book.